Uh, Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting, which means that some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those who are presenting virtually, please remember to mute your mic when you are not speaking and before you present, make sure to unmute your mic and turn on your camera. And for all presenters, please state your name for the record before responding to questions or before speaking, as we do have people who are listening virtually. Um, there's a consent agenda. Oh, there, oh, there is. Wow. Oh, gosh. I. Hmm? No. There is a consent agenda. It's hidden at the top. May I have a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Commissioner <coughs> Jaya Paul moves. Commissioner Myron seconds approval of C1. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jaya Paul? Aye. Commissioner Vega, P uh, sorry, Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Uh, Chair Kofori? Aye, the consent agenda is approved. Opportunity for public comment on non-agenda matters. This is the time for the board to hear public testimony and offer board deliberation. When I call your name, please come forward. Um, we have um, seven folks signed up. Um, so Richard Perkins, Robert Davis, and uh, Marsha Gulick and Christy McMurtry. Um, Whoever wants to go first. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ready? Yep. Yeah. Well, yes. Good morning again. Uh, my name is Christy McMurtry, and I use pronouns she and her. Um, I want to thank you for your time today and also, especially, your service uh, related to the huge responsibility you all share in advocating for those who have no ability to advocate for themselves due to their illness. And despite so many service providers and family who try so hard to do so. Uh, the four of us who are here today represent just a small fraction of a large, diverse, and talented group of volunteers who are very committed to giving their time and direct expertise to aid in the successful implementation of our county's behavioral health initiatives, as well as the Downtown Behavioral Health Resource Center. And that's what I'm here mostly to talk about today. I'm here because I want to know how can we as individuals or as members of, a, of an independent behavioral health task force and others like us, such as small service, smaller service providers, volunteer community groups, faith-based groups, um, nearby businesses, and, and so many other stakeholders in downtown especially who are so vested in the center's success, how, how can we get involved now um, to help guide policy, build community connections, and help advocate for the center. And I ask this because often when policies are developed and implemented with a narrow or a narrow range of stakeholders, there is a risk that these policies will not receive needed community buy-in and, and true supportive engagement. So this can lead to unintended consequences and the worst being in my mind, more trauma and lack of trust for those who are really hoping to benefit from having a safe haven and an open, welcoming health center in downtown. So the model for advisory councils is not new to the county. In fact, 10 years ago, when the program was relatively new, I was asked to serve on Multnomah County's ESA Advisory Council, representing families with loved ones who had spent two years in the program and there's no question that by bringing staff, peers, alumni parents, law enforcement, and youth-based organizations together that this has led to positive program changes and better outcomes. So my question really is, is there a plan to have such an advisory work group or council for the Behavior Health Resource Center? And if so, how can we learn more about the plan, how to get involved, and if not, why not? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hi. Morning. I'm Dick Perkins, a member of the unaffiliated Behavioral Health Task Force. My bio and contact information is provided in a written version of this testimony. We want to know the plan between the city and county when there is a mental health crisis that cannot be de-escalated or is violent in and around the Behavioral Health Resource Center, for instance. What agencies will be called 
using what dispatch? What are the options planned for stabilization? What are the options for transport? And is the plan between the city and county formalized? What is the county's plan now to implement the Behavioral Health Emergency Coordination Network, which would provide some of those things, now that the Measure 110 grant request was not funded? As a 16-year downtown resident and a volunteer in several organizations addressing homelessness, safety, and livability and behavioral health, I have been assaulted, threatened, and I witness daily crises related to meth or mental illness or both. I have called 911, 311, the mental health and non-emergency lines, reported to PDX reporter, and aided people in need directly on countless occasions. I have taken a course in mental health first aid and attended multiple sessions on de-escalation. What the city and the county are doing together right now around behavioral health is not working, and downtown is not safe for housed and unhoused alike. The Behavioral Health Resource Center, when properly implemented, will be a positive start. Please engage the whole community and let us help. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Bob Davis, member of Portland's Independent Behavioral Health Task Force, as we all are. As a physician, I've participated in a program in Philadelphia that succeeded providing people with access to behavioral health and addiction services that, that, that they desperately needed. When I moved to Portland in 2006, I practiced medicine until retirement in 2016. Since then, I've researched what has worked in this field and what has failed. In addition to the success that I saw in Philadelphia, I learned about successful initiatives in San Antonio, Texas, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Providence, Rhode Island. In 2019, <clears throat> I met the medical director of a recovery village in Lisbon, Portugal, where drugs were decriminalized in the year 2000. Outcomes were outstanding, including decreases in overdose and HIV deaths, reduction of chronic drug use, and 80% of graduates being able to stay in secure housing for three years or more. The above successful programs had two things in common, a trauma-informed approach to helping people in need and data-driven methods for creating policy. The trauma-informed data-driven approach is also a major factor in the success of Portland's Bybee Lake Hope Center, where I sit on the advisory board. Here in Multnomah County, we have an opportunity to replicate such success utilizing this approach to manage the Downtown Behavioral Health Resource Center scheduled to open this fall. To succeed, I recommend that homeless people are encouraged to register at this facility, especially those interested in admission to the shelter and transitional housing beds. Registration would include a trauma-informed intake by peers and behavioral health professionals. Information that's collected would facilitate personalized services for these individuals and would provide a database to help find evidence-based solutions to problems that arise. In addition, registered people should receive laminated picture IDs from the DMV, giving them access to full services around the metro area and help them get housing and employment. Initially, many visitors will be reluctant to register, but as the word spreads that the system is respectful and helpful, then more people will come forward. On July 20th, Julie Dodge and four other county officials joined me on a private tour of Bybee Lakes, seeing firsthand how such a system can work, and I believe some of you have also been out there. They seem very impressed, as I anticipated. I will gladly arrange a private tour of the Hope Center for any other county officials who are interested and I believe my email address is on the written testimony that I've just given. Uh, also, Julie and Krista both have my email address. The ultimate goal are the success of Multnomah County's Resource Center and solving the homeless crisis in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning again. My name is Marsha Gulick. I have lived in the South Par Parks blocks between Market and Clay for the last three years. I would like to know why there are no regular communications and updates on the Behavioral Health Resources Center being made to the public and to the media outlets. 
I have associate, associates in my downtown faith communities and living community who are very informed and up to date on what's going on in our city and county. When I mention to them that I am part of a behavioral health task force that is currently focused on the Behavioral Health Resource Center, I get responses of, oh yeah, I remember. What's, what's going on with that? I haven't heard or seen anything about it for months. And I explain what has been the focus of our group for the last eight months. We first met on December 10th, 2021, after a town hall meeting on December 8th with Commissioner Sharon Myron, Commissioner Dan Ryan, and Representative Lisa Reynolds, in which the Behavioral Health Resource Center was discussed. We committed to finding out about the center and finding out how we could tap into programs to bring people in need of mental health and addiction services into treatment and engage all stakeholders in making those services safe and effective for our community. We are committed to the success of the Behavioral Health Resource Center. We are grateful for all those who have been working to make this place a place of respite, peer support, and healing. We would like greater transparency about the key components of the plan and for there to be regular progress reports. We want to see county and city working together on the issue and engaging other stakeholders in the community. We want the Behavioral Re Health Resource Center to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, and I wanna thank you all for your contact with my office, and I know that you have a meeting tomorrow with Adam Renan, so we will discuss these items, continue to discuss all these items. Thank you. Uh, injured and pissed off. My real name is Injured and Pissed Off. Uh, July 14th, I spoke here and I failed to mention Colin Kaepernick's name. Uh, he was the football player that I was referring to that would get on his knees. Uh, Joe decided, Joe Walsh, uh, who isn't here anymore, uh, told me that he used to to try to emulate uh, Colin Kaepernick, and of course Joe wasn't up to physically doing that, so I suggested that he, uh, when they say the Pledge of Allegiance, turn his back on the flag, and that's what I do. In fact, I know a lot of blind people that you'd have to tell them which way the flag is positioned in the room so they could turn around the opposite direction. Uh, Anybody that would uh, think that it would, was marvelous for law enforcement in the county to ignore a service animal attacked seven times in less than six years by the same dog and to try to fight with the court and, and the board and city hall and uh, Lightning, he calls me the legend with my name. And I go, well, the losing legend is what it is. And uh, June 29th, I spoke at City Hall explaining that even my medical treatment, uh, they delayed after an hour when I went to the emergency room. I was laying on a stretcher with my service animal uh, in hand and I was, they told me that they were gonna discharge me with a pair of crutches. Well, I told them, okay, I can't even move. Well, gee, I guess we'll take some more x-rays and figure out what's wrong. Well, I had a broken hip for one thing and on my left side and they did the surgery and of course, for the next three days, they were standing me up. Well, we like to see patients recover and stand up, and uh, they were standing me up, and two big guys, and all I could do was throw up each time, and uh, they found out that I had two vertebrae in my spinal cord, and so that, they've also got a spinal cord uh, center up there, OHSU. And what they're supposed to actually do is treat the person and even 
give them a, a spinal shot in their spinal cord to relieve the, the symptoms of swelling and everything. Well, they don't do that for blind people that's complaining about their service animal being attacked. Thank so you. piss on the law. Thank you, sir. Lightning. My name is Lightning, I represent Lightning Super Karma, and again, I've changed your name to No Name County for the violence that was committed against the indigenous people in the past on why you're on their land and you don't make them monthly payments, which you could easily do, put it up into an indigenous people's fund. You're sitting on their land. The least you can do is make a reasonable market rate payment into their fund to where the indigenous people can have the best educations in the United States, where the indigenous people can have the finest cars, go to the best restaurants. Why am I saying that? Because they deserve that right. They should be the wealthiest in the county, in the city, but you refuse to pay them their payment for sitting on their land. You make land acknowledgments. You say it's their land, but you pay them nothing. Start paying them the money for their land. That's all I'm asking. That will make them the wealthiest people in the county, in the city, and they deserve that for the abuses that you've committed against them in the past to take over their land through violence. Now, looking at this picture, the Ku Klux Klan, what do you know about this? The article says, virtual headquarters here, members and sympathizers gain control of Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. My question to you, that term control of the board, were there actual commissioners that were Klansmen? Was a chair a Klansman? I want to have that history and really know who you are. I'm sitting here as the public speaking to you. I've taken your name off for the what you're going to do at the Central Library on those beautiful Japanese maple trees on the southwest Yamhill side, you're going to cut every one of those down, 18 of them, to put a little terrace and a table there. You're going to create a heat dome. You're cutting down one of the most beautiful trees in this city that we have to do that for your little table. That's mad. That's madness. Why would you ever do that? Nature has rights. Nature has rights. Thank you. Thanks. Pull up the name, Commissioner Jayapal Mumba. Thank M U M B A. Nature has Lightning. rights. Your time is up. Thank you very much. Please do that. Your time is and up. And listen to her. Charles Johnson. You will enjoy that. We do have security here in the Multnomah building. Good morning. And she is actually the third business here. All right. Enjoy COVID. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Charles uh, Bridge Crane Simka Johnson. And of course, nothing about us without us. So when you're making decisions that impact ultra poor people, people whose life depends on public benefits, it is definitely a very good idea to have uh, advisory 
panels that include the impacted people. Uh, I'm not as up to speed as the first four public comment people were about the developments with the BHRC, the Behavioral Health Resource Center. Um, most of my time is focused on what Cascadia is doing in providing me direct services as a patient. Um, but uh, I do look forward to this general idea of uh, a citizen advisory panel taking directly impacted people and creating a more welcoming behavioral health resource center that delivers the best possible results. Um, these results are very important because as you may have seen in recent news headlines, uh, within maybe less than an hour of discharge from Unity, a 34 pound or so stone was smashed into the skull of a woman. Uh, Dwayne, of course, is on a mental health no bond hold now in the county jail where we have dormitories full of empty beds with air conditioning, I think. Um, so uh, these things are important, but I know what you were really agonizing over is why is he wearing a different hat than he's ever worn here before? The answer is two toes surgically removed after frostbite. Not mine, fortunately. Uh, a person who camps in Portland is now uh, on the fifth floor of Portland Providence Medical Center uh, where he had to have two toes surgically removed, pinky toes from each foot. Um, because as uh, you can see from Sharon Myron's reaction, there is a failure of care systems when this happens. We can't put this all on the individual. Uh, homeless people, when they wake up, have to figure out what they're going to do about basically bodily functions like excretion. If you're sleeping somewhere, you've probably used what uh, we heard one of the legends say, piss on the law. Dealing with homelessness requires comfort with the phrase, piss bottle. People that you hire on rapid response know about cleaning up these things. Some people can try and get those to a sanitary sewer. Some can only get them into a storm drain. Sometimes they lay around on the sidewalk next to needles. So uh, there's an intersectionality there with the Behavioral Health Resource Center. I look forward to a more public and dynamic process and also scaled solutions because the BHRC can only do so much. Thank Thanks, you very Carol. much. That is all for our public testimony today. I will move on to R1. R1, resolution referring to Charter Review Committee proposed amendments to the voters in certifying ballot titles and explanatory statements. So moved. Second. Commissioner, <coughs> excuse me, I have uh, allergies this morning. Sorry. <coughs> Commissioner Stegman moves, Commissioner Myron seconds, approval of R1. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Kali O'Dell. I work in the Office of Community Involvement as the Charter Review Committee Program Coordinator. Uh, we're here today as a continuation of the Charter Review Committee's report to the public and to the board on August 2nd before moving forward to the business at hand, which is to refer amendments made by the Charter Review Committee to the ballot and to certify the ballot titles and explanatory statements for those measures. I'd like to provide a quick recap of the committee's report from last week. For those who are here today or watching who may not be familiar, the county has a home rule charter, which is like its local constitution. The charter codifies the structure and powers of county government and can only be amended with the approval of county voters. Multnomah County's charter requires that a charter review committee made up of electors from the county be convened every six years to make a comprehensive study of the charter. Based on its study, the committee can then choose to recommend amendments to the charter that it believes will improve county government. Based on this requirement, my office, the Office of Community Involvement, convened a charter review committee last year. The committee met from September 2021 through July 2022. Last week on August 2nd, members of the committee reported on the committee's work and recommendations. The committee mem members shared that their review of the charter was grounded in five shared values, justice, inclusive democracy, access and belonging, transparency and innovation. 
Three subcommittees focused on government accountability, equitable representation, and safety and justice relied on these values to study different aspects of the charter and propose changes. The full committee considered all of the proposals suggested by its subcommittees and ultimately decided to recommend seven measures to amend the charter. We'll actually skip a couple of slides forward <laughs> um, while I'll just do a quick overview of what those measures would do if they're adopted by the voters. Um, so these are the seven measures that they recommended. The first is to make language in the county charter gender neutral. The second is to change the Charter Review Committee membership requirements and selection process. It would also extend the Charter Review timeline, address the committee's leadership structure, and add a public education and engagement process to the charter. Three would establish an ombudsman, ombudsperson function in the office of the auditor. Four would add language providing for the auditor's timely, unrestricted access to information, records, and employees required to perform the duties of the auditor. Would also add a requirement that the county include a right to audit clause in contracts and subcontracts. The fifth recommendation would require members of the Board of Commissioners to inspect county jail facilities at least once a year with the participation of volunteers. Six would adopt ranked choice voting in elections for county offices by 2026. And seven would require the county to extend voting rights in county elections, including but not limited to non-citizens, to the furthest extent allowed by law. So with that quick refresher on the committee's work, I'll turn it over to the county attorney to talk about next steps. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny Madcore, your county attorney. We have Catherine Thomas, assistant county attorney online. Um, I'm here to talk about next steps. So where do we go from here? Uh, the Charter Review Committee has done the hard work. They've made the referrals. Um, Catherine Thomas, in collaboration with other attorneys in the office and interested party, parties, have crafted uh, the language that will amend the charter, as well as the ballot titles. And now we bring it to you. So the charter requires that the board refer all amendments proposed by the Charter Review Committee. As we heard, we have seven this time around, pretty substantial. Um, the, the, uh, the referral will include, we have the quoted language up here, it will say referred to the people by the Board of County Commissioners as recommended by the Multnomah County Charter Review Committee. And that's, that's going to be right in the voters pamphlet. So after this vote, uh, board votes to refer the matter, we will be filing the ballot titles with the elections office and that sets off the period for challenge. And that's a period where any interested party with, within seven business days can file challenges to the ballot titles. Now, these ballot titles have been crafted in accordance with law and to pretty strict standards, so we feel very confident that there, if there is a challenge, that we'll be able to review it in consultation with the court and get those challenges turned around very quickly so that it doesn't interfere with them actually getting onto the ballot. Uh, those challenges need to be made by August 22nd. Our final ballot titles need to be filed by September 8th. You can see that's a pretty tight timeline, but one that we think we can work within. And then the voters will be asked to decide in the November 2022 election um, whether or not to adopt those amendments. After that, if am amendments are adopted, we will amend the charter and then begin taking actions to fulfill the charter review committees and the voters' intent. So those are the questions I have. Catherine is here to answer um, any of the hard questions. Um, I'll take the easy ones. And um, unless there's anything else, we're ready to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Yes, we had a very thorough briefing last week with the committee members. It was um, much appreciated. <clears throat> um, do we have any public testimony in this item, Marina? Uh, yes, Lightning. Yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Karma. Why on earth the right to audit clause wasn't in every agreement that you've ever signed is beyond me. Absolutely 100% agree with the auditors. Uh, this should have been in long, long time ago. Now, looking at the charter itself, I'd like the members to begin to understand that 
We're going into this body-worn camera video phase, and I'd like to have put in, enshrined in the charter, that the release of that video will happen within seven days on any excessive use of force, meaning a police officer shooting any member of the public or any physical violence against a member of the public. You have the power to do that. When that is enshrined in the charter, I will then go to the commissioners to ask them to pass an ordinance. Then that will be law. Then the gatekeepers, which will be the sheriff on the video and the police chief, will not be able to stop the release. As you saw in Akron, Ohio, it was released within seven days because it was enshrined in the charter, because we had commissioners that care about the public and they understood it was their job and their responsibility to do that and not listen to what the sheriff wants, not listen to what the police chief wants, but what the people want and to protect their safety. Again, the charter has the ability to do this. It'll be the first of its kind in Multnomah County. We haven't even done the body-worn camera policy yet. But you can implement that down the line to ensure that Lightning Super Karma, his research lab on the video, will have access to that immediately to analyze and protect the community members. Now, the auditors, you have to be given free reign on what you do here. You can't be under control. You can't be controlled by the chair or the commissioners. You have to be independent. Even if it means taking state funding and separating yourself from this county, we have to have eyes on this county like we've never had before. And that is what this is about. This charter needs to also give the power and the authority to chair to fire that sheriff if he's out of line, Thank which you have no power, no authority. You're just the budget, Thank per you. your words. Thank you for your uh, testimony this morning. And if that's a blatant lie, you'll be on the Brady list before you know it. Trust oh, me. We have one more person signed up, Charles Johnson. Good morning, Commissioners. Charles Simka, Bridge Crane Johnson. And I want to thank you for getting this uh, particularly pertinent to local life topic on the agenda. Uh, proposed, uh, proposed amendments to the voters and certifying ballot titles and explanatory statements. Um, I don't know how this came to be on here right now, but right now, locally, we're in a bit of a mess with the city charter. Um, the city charter review commission uh, as you know, has put forth four basic ideas, and there's some anxiety now among different parts of the public about whether those are properly bundled as one thing or need to be separated into four different items. Um, this is like essential to good governance. I'm not sure even how I feel about getting all these good things passed as one package or having a more open democracy where there's separate items more clearly titled and more clearly explained. So um, I think that's what developed on this. I'm comfortable with you voting yes, except that we're really not doing the best thing for the public. Right now, the former Speaker of the House is running to be governor, and we don't really just need a city charter change. It's time for Multnomah County or No Name County to move into the future and have a unified city county government. There shouldn't be any charter blah blah going on in the city of Portland. The state legislature should have said, attention, pursuant to the vote of the state legislature, Multnomah County and the city of Portland are consolidated and will have X number of locally elected districts. So we can hope that uh, with a lot on the plate for the state legislature, someday they get to that, or that the county commission in the future will collaborate with the county and that will be part of your legislative initiative We'll still have our local municipal consolidated government, which will need to address things like 
uh, amendments to its charter and how to handle the ballot titles and the explanatory statements. But this f split between the city and the county is probably not upheld by any kind of empirical study. Um, I don't know all the ones, I don't remember of among Minneapolis and Jacksonville, Florida and Indianapolis, which cities have made that move. But I hope that in addition to passing this R1, that that will be in the legislative agenda talks going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, commissioners, can, I'm sorry, could you both come back up? So uh, to answer questions if commissioners have them, thank you. And I'll, as a reminder, we also have Catherine Thomas on the line who was instrumental in all of this work. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, commissioners, questions or comments? We'll start with District 1. Thank you, um, and I, I do really appreciate the comprehensive briefing that we received um, it wasn't this Tuesday, last week. Thank you. Um, it, it, was, uh, it provided so much insight and really great oppor uh, opportunity for questions. Uh, and so I am so grateful that this committee has chosen to focus on crucial tenets underlying a successful democracy. And those are transparency, accountability, equity, and inclusion. Our county charter is complex. It deals with many issues that are crucial to good government governance. And I really appreciate all of the members of the committee, the subcommittee chairs, Kali, um, and Danny and Catherine from the county and so many others. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for engaging in such a deep process, focusing on core aspects of government and governance over such a compressed timeline. Charter reform only happens every six years and it is a big deal. I know that our process is a little bit overshadowed by that of the city but that in no way diminishes its importance. And I wanna speak briefly to each of the items that are being, uh, that are part of the referral to the ballot. Um, so doing all of this in such a short amount of time is a huge achievement. And at the board briefing, we heard about some other important issues that might have been proposed had there been sufficient time to engage with community, research the issues, uh, and reach consensus. I absolutely support extending the time the Charter Review Committee has to bring forward. Amending the language in our charter to make sure it is gender, ne gender neutral is for me a no-brainer. It just seems like something that should be able to be done, but apparently uh, we do need to take this action and um, you know, the language that we use can make people feel excluded and invisible but it can also reassure people that they are seen and that they matter. This goes to the heart of equity and inclusivity, and I absolutely support it. In terms of who has the right to vote, I believe that people who live under our laws, contribute to our community, and are impacted by our policies should have the right to vote for the representatives and policies that impact them. This is, a, this is just basic fairness and justice. There are so many you know, individual reasons, um, but, but when we think about fairness and justice for all, that, is, that overlies everything here. Our state constitution does not explicitly prohibit doing this, and so I believe that we can pursue this important step forward, a leap forward, as has been done in a few other jurisdictions. I also know there are a lot of questions that will need to be answered and for the issue, however, itself, I believe we need to be pushing the envelope. And as we did with campaign finance reform, we need to challenge the status quo on issues of this import. I support that proposal as well, if you couldn't tell. Um, regarding the requirement to inspect county jails once a year with constituent participation, I do appreciate the intent of improving accountability and transparency. I'm not sure that this will be the most effective way necessarily to achieve the desired goal, but it's, it's fine. I do not oppose that. 
For ranked choice voting, I do need to learn more about the exact approach that will be used, how it will be implemented, et cetera. Um, I believe there are significant problems in our current system, how we vote, what our, you know, what that process looks like, and there are a number of ways the system could be improved. I also know there are a lot of different mechanisms, even within the confines of, you know, ranked choice voting could be done in a number of different ways. There are different approaches, so I need to learn a lot more about this. This is one I don't yet have an opinion on. Um, but the final recommendations I, I do have very strong opinions on. For me, good governance is rooted in accountability and transparency. And I really appreciate that our auditor has brought forward a number of suggestions to be considered by the Charter Review Committee based on her experience in trying to do her job. And I am very glad that the committee elected to proceed with two key recommendations. I know that these will address real issues and that they will ho hold the board accountable to the people we serve, to our employees, and allow the auditor to do her essential job more effectively. In terms of adopting the role of ombudsperson and housing this in the auditor's office, I believe this is absolutely necessary and it should be enshrined in our charter. I know some of my colleagues um, feel the role could and should be adopted in code, but I disagree because the reality is that we've needed an ombudsperson at the county forever, and yet it isn't in code. You know, saying we'll do it now after it's been called out, it's not sufficient. Having the role be in code makes it so, um, so that the board actually has the oversight of, of these requirements and defines the role um, about the people, how do I say it? this is, uh, you know, that it's having the role in code prevents subjectivity um, or allows subjectivity depending on the whims of whoever happens to be on the board. And right now we have, you know, great people on the board. Um, but having this in code is not accountability. I believe it's conflict of interest. And I believe that the existence of the position should be housed in charter. I also strongly support the amendment ensuring that the auditor has timely unrestricted access to information, records, and employees required to perform their duties. And I strongly support including the right to audit clauses in contracts and subcontracts. I was actually very surprised to hear that this was not something that already existed. I've seen how challenging it can be to try to access information and records, and have seen the results of the auditor not being able to audit the contracts and subcontracts by which virtually all of the county's business is done. Just last uh, week ago, a couple of weeks ago, when we heard about duplication of payment to one of our contractors, fortunately this was brought to our attention, but we should have caught this. And if we didn't, maybe if there was an audit that could go through our contracts and do a systematic review, in a timely fashion with access to full information, maybe we could catch this kind of thing on a systematic level. I believe this is the kind of access and oversight, you know, it should be assumed, but the reality is it hasn't. So this transparency, access, and accountability is essential to our role and function, and I strongly support including this language in, the char in Charter. As we improve our systems, continue to move forward with our goals of creating equitable and inclusive processes, we need to make sure that we are held to account. Though your timeline was short for this committee, and there's even more that maybe could have been done given more time, and hopefully there'll be more time in the future, you accomplished so much. And these recommendations truly came from community. Thank you again to the staff who have supported this process and to all the community members who dedicated their time, energy, heart, and soul. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Kalei Jenny. Uh, the briefing that we got last week was so thorough. I don't have any questions. I do have a few comments and really uh, uh, you know, want to appreciate what an important process this is. Um, so once in a six years charter review process is one of the most important governance requirements in our charter. 
It allows Multnomah County residents through the committee to step back and take a broad look at the structure of their county government and at whether that structure can be improved to serve the values of equity, representation, effective government, transparency, accountability, and justice. It's an enormous task and responsibility, and I wanna thank all the members of the committee for stepping forward to take it on and for the diligence, thoughtfulness, and commitment with which you approached your work. All residents of Multnomah County owe you a debt of gratitude. In terms of your recommendations, I'll briefly mention two that I think are particularly important, not touching on gender neutral language because as Commissioner Myron stated, I, I think that's a no brainer. Um, first, the changes you recommended to the charter review process itself, especially extending the time allowed. Given the breadth of the task and the time required for a new committee to just get up to speed on how the county operates, the extra six months you've recommended adding will, I think, allow the committee to be even better informed and tackle even broader ideas the next time around, as well as to elicit more community feedback. I'm also strongly supportive of the recommended expansion of voting rights. As the provider of basic social and healthcare services to residents who otherwise would not be able to access these services, Multnomah County serves a disproportionate number of people who aren't US citizens or for other reasons cannot vote in our elections. Those residents of the county contribute to the economic and social well-being of the county at large. It's to everyone's benefit that they thrive. And we need their voice and participation in government in order to make sure that they do thrive. While there may be legal issues lying ahead, there are times when we need to push the legal envelope, and this is one of them. Finally, I appreciated your reporting back to us on the wide range of issues you considered but did not take action on, in most cases because you didn't feel you had the time to thoroughly examine the issues. You raised two issues in particular that I think do deserve further consideration. First, the issue of whether a county manager position should be inserted into the charter. That's a complicated question. As you discussed when you briefed us, the underlying issue here is whether the county would be better served by a governance structure that creates more distributed leadership and greater checks and balances than our present structure. That's an important question and I hope to see it taken up. And second, the possibility of creating an elected public defender position. As I noted during the briefing last week, that also would be a complicated question and a complicated change. I don't know what the ultimate answer is. I don't, I don't have an opinion on that, but it's worth considering, if only to highlight the crisis we're facing statewide in our public defense system. Since Multnomah County has the largest footprint in our statewide criminal legal system, we have the largest share of defendants and victims affected by the lack of public defense, and so are most affected by this crisis. It's an absolute travesty of justice, and it needs to be addressed. And while I certainly hope that we are no longer in the situation six years from now, if we are, all solutions need to be on the table. So again, thank you so much to the committee members for your service, and a final thank you to OCI staff, Kelly O'Dell, Danny Bernstein, Catherine Thomas, Jenny Madcor, everybody else who supported this work. It couldn't have happened without you. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, everyone, Kali and uh, Jenny and, and, and Catherine and, and the entire Charter Review Committee. Uh, I, I think it's important uh, for our citizenry to have the opportunity, and while we all have our individual opinions as county commissioners, I think the intent of having a Charter Review Committee is to hear from the people. And uh, so I just want to uh, honor that opportunity for people to come and speak about uh, what they feel are the most important issues uh, given the time constraints. I did have some kind of technical questions. I don't know if you all will be able to answer, but I had read somewhere around ranked choice voting that potentially a candidate could, could win with a 25% vote. Does anybody know that? Maybe that's a question I don't know for for our elections. I do not have the answer to that question. Um, not also not an expert on ranked choice voting. So. Okay. Uh, well, we will we'll do some more digging. Uh, and then the uh, the inspection of our county jails. It says with volunteers. Do we how? What is the explanation? And what I mean, what does that mean? I guess I'm wondering what the language looks like. How is a volunteer defined and decided? You want to take a first stab at it? You want me to? Uh, we may be best to start with uh, reading from the text of um, what we talk. What's what will be in the amendment? Um, 
and I can certainly talk a little bit more to the committee's intention, but some of the things that um, they hoped to see in the process aren't necessarily things that will end up in the charter. And don't forget, we have Catherine on the line too. Yeah, for the hard <laughs> for the hard questions. <laughs> I know. Um, so we do have um, our Exhibit D in the board packet is the proposed language that actually amends the charter. And in that, it says that at least one volunteer member of the public shall be selected with uh, to participate with each board member in the in the inspections. And so a uh, preference will be given to um, those who live or work in Multnomah County or have a demonstrated connection with the county. Um, the volunteers must be independent from the county auditor or the county jail or correctional institution that's being inspected. Um, and that's basically all the information that we have within the charter amendment that would limit um, the the selection of the volunteers. However, there will be an application process and then commissioners could also consider other factors or, that are permissible under law in the selection of volunteers to accompany them. Great, thank you. And then I assume you, you would be running that process out of your office, Kali, or do we know? It doesn't specify, so it would be up to the, up to the board or individual uh, commissioners depending on how uh, the county decides to implement that. Um, I know that the committee was hoping to see a process, an application process similar to the one that they went through in terms of their selection, feeling like that did a thorough job of um, assessing people objectively um, based on, on set criteria. Um, and so it's their interest to see something like that, but isn't something that they specified in their charter amendment. TBD. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, the last question I have is around uh, extending voting rights uh, to non-citizens. I'm wondering, will that, because I know that the language was, was intentionally very broad, but I'm wondering, will that have any implications uh, for our community members that are incarcerated and their vote, voting rights? So again, going back to our board packet, we have exhibit B, which is the proposed text. And as you correctly point out, Commissioner, it's very broadly worded so that um, if this were to pass in the charter, then the next step would be for the county to study and then present to the Board of County Commissioners proposed legislative changes that would expand or could expand the right to vote. Um, and that could include incarcerated persons. Uh, it could deal with people under the age of 18. It could deal with people who are non-citizens. And then there are probably other classifications that we would certainly want to study to see if other disenfranchised individuals could be brought in, if there's a legal path forward to do that. Great, thank you. Uh, you did really well, thank you. Uh, and again, thank you to, to the Charter Review Committee uh, for all of your time and your effort. And I'll just pile on my thanks. Um, I think, um, appreciate that we will be giving, if the voters choose, giving more time for the Charter Review Committee to look at all of the items before them. I do, however, anticipate that there will always be items that you have to pick and choose and, and prioritize which, um, which issues go forward and which are kept back for another day and another study. Uh, with that, Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Segman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The resolution is adopted. Thank you so much. Thank you. R2, notice of intent to apply for up to $11,083,300 to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention over five years. So moved. Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R2. Good morning. Good morning. Mark Harris, Strategy and Grant Development Manager for the Health Department. Hi, Tamika Brazil, uh, Director of Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. And Kim Taves is joining us virtually. Good morning, everyone. Kim Taves, Communicable Disease Director with Multnomah County Public Health. Okay, well, we're here today to uh, request your approval to submit an application for just over $11 million over a five-year period to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Strengthening U.S. Public Health Infrastructure Workforce and Data Systems Grant Opportunity. These funds are competitive, but eligibility is limited, and uh, all eligible applicants will be funded as long as they meet the application criteria that's submitted. Um, the Health Department's the only local jurisdiction in Oregon that's eligible to receive this direct federal funding. That's due to our population size uh, relative to the city of Portland. Oregon Health Authority is also eligible. 
um, because uh, if we didn't apply, for example, then they would be able to take our allocation. Um, so we're able to maximize the funding coming in locally um, because of the direct federal funds. The purpose of the grants to address longstanding deficits in the public health system, um, including ensuring the provision of basic public health services and growing the public health workforce. The grant has three strategy areas that are focused on workforce, foundational capabilities, and data modernization. We're eligible to apply for the workforce and foundational capabilities components, so the first two strategies. Um, the workforce funding is about 8.5 million of the total, and that all comes in in one chunk in November when the grant's awarded, and we have flexibility to spend that over the five-year grant period. And then uh, the foundational capabilities component's about 500,000 a year, and that'll be awarded on an annual basis, so we'll get the first allocation again in November when that comes in, and then 500 in subsequent years. The allowable activities for workforce are really focused on recruiting and hiring public health staff, retaining public health staff, um, supporting and sustaining the workforce, um, including like workforce wellness strategies, um, also providing trainings to new and existing staff, uh, and then also just strengthening kind of workforce related planning and systems, processes, and policies. The foundational capabilities activities are focused around accountability and performance management, including public health accreditation. Um, again, strengthening organizational competencies related to human resources, contracting procurement, um, and other such areas. And there's also some ability to focus on communications or policy development or community partnerships and emergency response. The outcomes are really around um, diversifying public health staff and retaining a diverse public health staff, and then just also increasing our capacity to support the workforce. Um, I'll hand it over to Mika now, and she'll kind of talk about the approach we're taking to the grant. Yep. Good morning Good again. Morning. Thank you, Mark. So um, I'd like to, to note that our approach reflects the, the stated needs of the health department and the public health division as a whole, and also includes feedback and recommendations from community partners and the auditor's report. We will utilize key successes and lessons learned related to COVID-19 response and broader quality assurance activities to inform the implementation and to support the infrastructure improvements. We considered federal funding streams that will be sunsetting over the next fiscal year or two, such as ARPA, the health disparities um, funding and public health modernization. This grant will allow our health department to expand and implement new workforce and infrastructure strategies and gain public health accreditation, which is one of the, the grant requirements. Um, it will also extend some of our staffing contracts funded by federal um, COVID grants, again, ARPA, set to expire um, very quickly here in the next two years. Time is flying by. This is also a funding intent of the CDC. We're very excited that this grant will allow us to strengthen partnerships with academic institutions by doing things like increasing student rotations, internships, and placements, both internally and in the community. Um, along with developing best practices and co-learning and whatnot. Um, other workforce support activity examples could include supporting WESP in integration, equity coaching, and professional development training for staff at all levels, um, cross-training across content areas, succession planning, staff onboarding, with a particular focus on supporting our staff who are black, um, indigenous, and, and people of color. Um, developing on-call workforce to support emergencies, system improvements related to hiring and contracting, quality assurance and improvements, again, the accreditation piece and integrating public health and behavioral health, along with evaluation of workforce activities and other related programming um, throughout the department. Our staffing and contracting examples include maintaining and enhancing core capacity for our uh, programming um, under the public health umbrella, which include communicable disease, environmental health, community partnerships and capacity building, our chronic disease prevention and health promotion, parent child and family health, and um, in addition to our CBO coalition contracts um, and emergency response planning. So oh, there was a press release this past Wednesday that also shared Oregon's public health workforce report put out by the Oregon Coalition of Local Health Officials that speaks to the challenge, um, challenges we're um, currently experiencing in public health as it relates to not only hiring but retaining staff. 
and we anticipate that this grant will enhance our organizational strategy and infrastructure um, and sustain priority programming and services within the department and other community partners. I'd also like to again um, just highlight the particular focus that, that will be placed on addressing disparities within our, our black, um, indigenous staff of color communities and investing in critical infrastructure as bringing people um, in who both love and know their communities is a critical um, need we're faced with today in order to maintain and continue to build the trust in those who utilize our services and participate on our community boards and coalitions. Thank you. And Kim Taves, do you have anything to add or are you here for questions? I'm just here for backup and questions. All right. Thank you. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this item? Uh, yes. Uh, Charles Johnson. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, as you know, for the record, I'm Charles Simka Bridge Crane Johnson. And finally, uh, all positive uh, thank you around uh, thing. Um, of course, we'll do the local thank yous uh, to Ebony Clark and Kim Taves and Tamika Brazil. And they might not appreciate it, but we even can thank Kristen Cinema, Senator from Arizona. Thank you, all federal officials that did not screw this up, particularly senators like Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema that we can have $11 million of federal funds come in. It sounds like from the description, it's not even a competitive limited grant. So every local authority that is smart enough to go after the money will be able to help staff up a more diverse workforce so that they can have not just people who are culturally informed, but people who are directly from the cultures they're serving, more Native American uh, people working in public uh, health more African-American, black people working in public health, providing service to their communities. So obviously, this is a no-brainer. Sometimes I wonder why you've left these good things as a 10-minute, I guess it's a breath of fresh air, um, because we know you're going to vote yes to take 11 million federal dollars and put them into the community where people experiencing uh, health disparities can have more encounters with people that uh, they can have a strong sense of identity and respect with. So thank you all for uh, the unanimous yes vote that you're about to do. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions from commissioners or comments? Uh, we'll start this time with Commissioner Jaipal. Thank you, Chair. Um, it really seems like a great opportunity. So echoing Charles, it is a very good moment. Um, and it's, while nothing in life is guaranteed, it sounds like we are eligible and the allocation is based on population, so we should get this. Okay, great. I guess just... Um, in, in terms of understanding how it's gonna be used, it sounds like part of it will be used to pay for existing temporary staff that we have. And, um, you know, would, would those folks, it sounds like some of them do some COVID related work, other work as well. So does it allow us to expand programming? Is it, or is it more that it allows us to pay existing staff so that they've got the capacity to do what they're doing now better because we know everyone's stretched. It's a good question. It's, it's a little bit of both. So um, with sort of staff who we have in, not all of them are COVID staff. So there's like some immunization staff, for example, where we'll have some fiscal cliffs in the current funding we have. Um, same within, you know, Tamika's program as well as our other programs. So I think we're going to be able to hire about 12 FTE with the funds per annually per year. And there'll be some new hires. There's a requirement to bring on, um, you know, like a project director as well as an evaluator. And we need some project management support to kind of move forward some of the workforce strategies. So there's that piece. And then that'll be kind of the new work that's moving forward. And then we'll be able to move folks that otherwise we might have to lay off or find another way to fund onto this funding stream in order to maintain continuity of services in some of our critical areas that have been built out over the last uh, couple years with, with kind of COVID related funding, if, if that makes sense. Yep, it does. That's great. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to read my handwriting here. Yeah, I think that was it. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mark and Tamika and Kim. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, getting upstream 
like what I'm thinking about is like youth uh, in elementary school, in high school, and how do we start engaging them? And I know you talked a little bit about Tamika, uh, but can you kind of talk about like what you foresee and how we start engaging and getting kids interested in public health and health? Absolutely. Um, this week, we actually had a meeting with the, the in the REACH program with a, a cohort to um, in a partnership with Boys and Blazer Boys and Girls Club, um, so, sort of to get start to get the younger generation interested in public health careers and opportunities, and it'll come along with some of some training and whatnot. That was some of the visioning for the younger piece, although um, not cited as an example here. We're really excited about really expanding and increasing partnerships with the um, academic institutions, the, the colleges and whatnot as well. That's great. I'm really happy to hear that. That's wonderful. The other thing I was thinking about too, and I don't believe our county does this, but there are some counties that uh, do student debt forgiveness. Is that uh, something you've looked at? We had a long laundry list of incentives and, and ways to um, both um, attract um, folks to come into our workforce and retain, and, and that was one of the things on the list. So it's a possibility. Yeah, uh, there's a couple, I think the first year, year and a half of the grant will be a lot of kind of assessment and planning and figuring out what some of the actual best strategies are to move forward over the last kind of three quarters of the grant. So. There, there's a lot of flexibility in these funds and the CDC put them out in that way so that folks who get them can actually use them for what they need them for and prioritize how they need to prioritize it. So we have some flexibility in our approach for sure and we'll definitely do some planning um, you know, across the department and, and working with other county stakeholders as well to figure out some of the best paths forward to support the workforce. Awesome. Did you have anything else yeah, to me? Well, I was just going to add some of the other innovative ideas along that line of thinking um, was, was uh, around um, helping, you know, the workforce here falls between the cracks. And so they don't always um, um, are not eligible for the low income programs to help with child care and just emergency assistance funding. And so that was some of the other um, incentive conversations and ideas that were brought forward. Fantastic. Very exciting. Thank you, CDC. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate this presentation. This is, it's very exciting um, to hear about this potential. And um, I, I just had a couple of questions and it sounds like um, part of the, when I was just reading about the grant, um, that there, there were three areas um, we're pursuing workforce and foundational stuff, but there's also a data um, component, and I'm just curious if we had considered that and um, and what our thoughts were about that and why we would not be pursuing that. Yeah, it's a good question. We did, but um, we heard it wasn't clear when the um, in the actual grant application, but through the Big Cities Health Coalition and their relationship with the CDC, we found out that the CDC really only wants um, people who are organizations who are directly receiving what they call ELC data modernization funds from the CDC to apply for that component. So because we don't receive them directly, we weren't actually eligible to apply for that component. So we were actually hoping we could, but because we aren't a direct recipient of that funding stream, then we actually aren't eligible to apply for that one. Okay. That super helpful the state is applying the like, state receives whoa. those funds and they're gonna they're gonna apply so they're able to take our allocation that we would have got so it actually okay. bumped their stuff up a little bit so at least the money's still coming in to to the state, yeah, to the state. <laughs> um that that's great and um you know my other questions i can just ask offline um but really appreciate this um and it's great great to hear about thanks Thanks to all of you for your work on this. Uh, Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The NOI is approved. Thanks. Thank you. R3, approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon Department of Transportation for the Sandy Boulevard Gresham City Limits 230th Avenue project. Second. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of all of R3. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Chair Kafori and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Emily Militich, an Engineering Services Manager with the DCS Transportation Division. Today, I'm requesting approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon Department of Transportation 
for the Sandy Boulevard Gresham City Limits to 230th project in East Multnomah County. Uh, the primary purpose of this project is to close an important east-west gap in the regional active, active transportation network in order to increase safety, um, non-auto auto trips, um, especially for the underserved populations in Fairview and the surrounding uh, East Multnomah County communities. Uh, Sandy Boulevard is both a regional active transportation corridor and a regional freight corridor, corridor and the existing layout does not meet current county design standards. Um, or standards defined in uh, the Sandy Boulevard corridor refinement plan. Um, upgrading the corridor will improve safety by reducing conflicts between various modes of transportation and improve the reliability of this section of Sandy as a regional freight route. Uh, during project development, we'll take a look at various improvements to address safety, including separation of uh, different modes of travel uh, by closing those gaps in the sidewalk and bike lanes. Uh, install, installation of mid-block crossings and rapid flashing beacons, improved street lighting, um, adding additional bus pullouts, and improving um, bus stop paths. We'll also take a look at continuous uh, center turn lane to allow safer left turn movements and to reduce congestion. Uh, this IGA is just for the initial planning phase of the project, so it doesn't include um, final design or construction but um, we have applied for regional flexible funds for those later phases. Um, so should we be awarded those funds, then we'll uh, take all the work that we've done in the planning phase and apply it to um, future project phases. Uh, one of the major components of uh, the project development will include a customized outreach strategy, which will really be focused on gathering inclusive input and support for the project. We'll use our existing Title VI plan and processes to identify and engage with those community stakeholders um, for getting that in input on developing different project concepts and then evaluating all of those different design alternatives that I talked about. So the total IGA um, will includes a total project cost of about $1.4 million, of, of which um, about $1.275 million our federal funds, which get passed through to ODOT and then through to the county. Uh, so that just leaves about 146,000 that will be from the county road fund in both federal fis or fiscal year 23 and 24. So thank you uh, for your time today. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Emily. Uh, Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. All right, uh, commissioners, questions or comments? We'll start with Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Emily. Uh, so you had mentioned that uh, it's a 1.4 million project cost, but it's for the design phase only. Uh, so do we know the cost for the actual implementation of this project? Um, yes and no. So the 1.4 is for what we call project development, and that's kind of um, basically up through doing some uh, that important outreach work, developing some alternatives and getting to about what we would classify as about a 30% design. So it kind of gives you concepts and helps really uh, solidify what we think that that cost estimate will be. Um, we did um, apply for funding for those later phases for design, um, and then uh, right of way acquisition and construction. And that amount was about $20 million for the entire length of the corridor. But we're also looking at, um, at breaking that up into different phases. So they're a little bit more manageable chunks um, that we could tackle, um, you know, maybe sequentially. Great. Well, it's a, it's a very good start. And as we look at Vision Zero principles, we all know that so many people, uh, unfortunately, are being killed, pedestrians, bicyclists. I was driving um, on the west side of the county, and I was like, why don't we have bike lanes? <laughs> why don't we have buffers and protected areas uh, in East County as much as the rest of the county? So very excited to see this work move forward. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. Thank you so much, Emily, no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman? I'm sorry, Commissioner Jayapal? Yes, you've already gone. Thank you for your work, Emily, no questions. Thank you, Emily. And Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kofori? Aye. The IGA is approved. Thanks. Thank you.
R4, proclaiming August 7th through the 13th, 2022 as National Health Center Week in Multnomah County, Oregon. Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R4. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. For the record, my name is Adrian Daniels. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the interim director for Integrated Clinical Services, which serves as the community health center for Multnomah County. Good morning. For the record, my name is Harold Odiambo. I use he, his, and him, and I'm the community health center board chair for the Multnomah County Community Health Centers. Good morning. For the record, my name is Danielle Sobel. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Government Affairs for the Oregon Primary Care Association, which represents the 34 health centers in the state. All right. So again, good morning, and thank you for giving us this opportunity, uh, Chair Kafori and the commissioners, um, for, having, uh, for, the, for giving us this opportunity for the National Health Center Week proclamation. So I'm here joined today by Adrian Daniels, uh, who is our interim uh, executive director for ICS, uh, Daniela Sobel, who is the Oregon Primary Care Association, uh, director for policy and government affairs. We also have uh, Madi, uh, who is the government affairs director. So I'd like to say that I'm honored to join uh, you in celebrating uh, community health centers. So during the National Health Center Week, we recognize the vital role uh, the health centers play in safeguarding the well-being of communities and honor the staff who show up to work every day in service of the community. Community health centers are the cornerstone of our public health system, the lifeline of our communities, providing access to care to everyone, irrespective of their age, ethnicity, gender identity, and economic status. Community health centers focus on holistic care for individuals. They play a key role in supporting thriving communities. Community health centers reduce overall costs of care by helping manage patients' uh, chronic conditions, which keep them out of costly uh, healthcare settings uh, like emergency rooms. So over 50 years, Multnomah County community health centers have been providing high quality primary care, integrated uh, behavioral health, student health, dental, pharmacy, services to the residents uh, of Multnomah County. So, and I would also just like to add beyond uh, primary care, medical, dental, behavioral health, I would say our community health centers also do offer supportive services and enabling services as well. And I'm looking at things such as translation services, uh, transportation, uh, to transportation assistance to, to the clinics and many different places. We also have HIV services that are offered, insurance enrollment, nutrition, uh, pharmacy, and a lot of different outreach to the communities, uh, even up to their homes. And I'd like to say again, I'm proud of all the work that the staff of the community health centers do every day and I would like to end by thanking you for supporting and the commitment uh, for the mission of Multnomah County's Health Center. So I'd like to invite uh, Daniela from the OPCA to give a few remarks. Thanks, Harold. Um, and as this is a National Health Center Week and celebrated nationally, but both, um, or should I say, both nationally and in the state, um, I just want to share a little bit about what our health center program is, how we got here, and what we do in Oregon and especially in Multnomah County. Um, so the Health Center program actually originated in 1965. So it goes back to the days when we actually implemented Medicare and Medicaid. It was part of that war on poverty, but really actually came from the communities. It was brought from reform-minded physicians, nurses, community partners, and then the federal government as a partnership to really empower um, our urban and rural communities to direct their own health care within their communities. 
Um, that small investment back in 1965 has grown over the last six decades, and it's incredible to say we've had it for six decades, almost six decades, um, but again, has really strengthened those communities that you just heard from Harold, right? Has built out those community health centers, has built those services into their communities um, and, and empowered us to do that. Um, each health center is individual, it's a nonprofit, um, and what we like to say actually is if you've seen one health center, you've seen one health center. No two health centers are alike. And I know Multnomah County can speak to that. You have many of them here in Multnomah County as well, whether that's you know Central City Concern, Outside In, NARA Northwest, many, many, and that's not a comprehensive list. Um, but again, what they all share is that same mission to um, provide that high quality, cost effective service to everyone, regardless of ability to pay or insurance status. Um, in Oregon, as I mentioned, we have 34 federally qualified health centers, and that is our full name. We are federally qualified health centers, but also known as community health centers. You'll hear us call ourselves that. Um, we're at about 270 sites throughout the state, um, and we're in all counties except for two. And again, those two counties are just by population, not big enough to actually need that in their, in their space. Um, we serve about 416,000 Oregonians. Um, and again, the four components of those health centers is serving in those high areas of need, so what we call medically underserved areas, that comprehensive set of services that Harold just mentioned, right? Everything from the primary um, medical, your behavioral health, your oral, and then those social determinants of health and all of the enabling services. Um, open to everyone, and they are operated by patient majority boards. So actually, as Harold is the chair, runs one of those boards and operates that here from Multnomah County. Um, before I hand it over to Adrian to talk about Multnomah County, I do want to just share a really good example of why we are so crucial in our communities that relates to COVID. I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about our COVID <laughs> times and being on those front lines. Um, but wanted to share that recent data actually has shown that we as health centers are disproportionately responsible for getting um, communities of colors vaccinated. So in Oregon, um, about 41% of our patients are of a racial or ethnic minority that they report or get self-reported, and 89% are at or below 200 over the federal poverty level. So again, serving those vulnerable marginalized communities, but really speaks to how we do reach and how we've had that impact in those communities. Thank you. Thank you, thanks for coming this morning. Thank you, Harrod and Daniel. Um, I'll keep my comments brief, and I could share lots of numbers and statistics about the care we provide today as Multnomah County's health center, but I wanna focus today instead on a story. Last month, I was at the East County Community Health Center. I took a short break to use the restroom, and I crossed paths with a woman. She paused and looked at me and saw my badge, which features a smiling pill, and asked if I spoke Spanish and wanted to know if I was a pharmacist. Spoiler alert is that I would make a terrible pharmacist, <laughs> and my Spanish is at best only conversational. However, I knew that exactly 20 feet away, in a hall down the room, in a room down, down the hall, um, I had a room full of staff who were experts in that. And within a minute, I could walk the woman over. She met with a bilingual provider who immediately could review her patient medication questions, and then immediately scheduled a follow-up call with a clinical pharmacist on that site. Healthcare happens in a lot of formal ways. Appointment scheduling, eligibility workflows, care planning, but it also happens in restrooms. And that's what I really love about our work. We're in the community and we have the spaces and we work with staff to meet patients where they're at, no matter what. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today and to recognize the work of community health centers in Multnomah County. Thank you, thank you all so much. Good to see you. And what a nice week to celebrate National Health Center Week. All right, uh, commissioners, questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Myron. Thank you so much uh, to all of you um, and to the people who work, the hundreds of people who work in our community health centers um, at the county and then thousands more, <laughs> of course, at the state. Um, Harold. I um, just, it's so great to see you here today in person. Uh, I've seen you on some, some virtual meetings, but this is so much better. And um, you have been just an incredible partner and really striving to enhance partnership and collaboration with the county in your work uh, with the um, patient, the, the board that actually controls 
the the uh, the community health centers. And I just loved your description that the CHCs they're the lifeline of our communities because that that's exactly what they are. And I just want to thank you and your board for the tireless work um, as the heart and soul of that lifeline serving our community. So thank you. Thank you. And Danielle, it is. So it's just so great to see you here today. Um, I know Danielle from way back, way back um, uh, <laughs> at the OMA, working on all kinds of policies and particularly op around opioids. And it, it is just great to have you in this position um, particularly. And um, I appreciate your talking about that reach that you have to marginalized communities and that uh, deep impact, especially, you know, the perfect example is vaccination um, for those who are most marginalized uh, in, in, in the COVID pandemic. So thank you. And Adrian, thank you um, just for all of your work in Multnomah County. And um, it's, you know, there, our clinics do play such an essential role in our community. You provide those fundamental care and services. And, you know, I often talk about the ER being the place where people fall through the cracks in all of our systems of care meant to support them, but not doing so effectively. And they end up in that place of crisis. And you catch them, you catch them before they fall into crisis. And, you know, I, I ran for office because I knew if we intervened upstream, we could prevent that crisis from happening. You are that work in action. You connect on so many levels, and I love the how you talk about the scope of that work, that it is just so much more than what one, you know, typically thinks of medicine within the four walls of a clinic. It is everything. It is accessing benefits. It's housing and homelessness. It is just ad addressing whatever needs people have, and you just do it so effectively. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll ask Adrian at the end, yeah, how many languages, I mean, there are so many languages spoken at our clinics, and you reach people where other pe others can't. So, I don't know, I just so deeply value your work, admire all the work of those in our community health centers, and um, am so glad for your partnership and this unique role we have as the county here to um, to help support um, our community members. So, thank you, Mr. Jaipal. Thank you, Chair. I'll continue to heap on the thanks, the gratitude, and the praise. Um, Thank you all so much, Adrian, Harold, and um, Danielle, for being here, for bringing this proclamation forward. Harold, thank you for all of the work that you do. The heart that you put into this work is evident every time I see you. Um, and I, you know, that, that I too picked up on that metaphor of the community health clinics as being a lifeline to the community, and I think you really embody that, so thank you. Danielle, thank you for the history. I, I am new to the world of healthcare. I'm new to the world of community health clinics. And you know, I knew that they were created in the 1960s, but really kind of reflecting on how that came about, I think is an important piece of understanding why they're successful, why they're so important to our system, and how we continue to, to maintain that. And Adrian, um, thank you for all of the work you do. Thank you for that story. Thank you for just taking us right back to the heart of the work and, and why it matters. Um, that just was very, very moving and impactful. Um, you know, I do have a few prepared comments here just, just to, to, to recognize the importance of the system um, and the work that everybody in the system does to improve total health care, health and well-being for so many in our community. They are absolutely a critical, I, I would go so far as to say the critical component to our health care system, and I know they're appreciated countywide. Um, nationwide, 33% of people couldn't access health care mainly because of unaffordability, and as such, community health clinics, the work that you all do, um, to offer health care that can provide health care to economically disenfranchised people in communities is so important. And that unaffordability, we know disproportionately impacts black, indigenous, and other people of color and LGBTQ communities, as well as those with disabilities and those impacted by economic injustice, meaning that community health centers are a social justice issue and a social justice strategy. 
As Danielle highlighted, community health centers as a social justice issue emerged because of communities organizing and advocating in the 1960s. And in that same spirit, this board has also proclaimed that we believe that the healthcare system needs to be a universal single payer system. And so I think we continue that tradition of organizing around ensuring access and affordability. And we'll continue to do that and we'll continue to, to recognize and support how the community health center system is part of that continuum of accessibility. So again, thank you all so much for the proclamation. Thank you for the work that you do. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, I echo uh, all of the, the sentiments that uh, Harold, uh, I remember first meeting you and uh, was just so struck about your commitment and caring uh, for our community. Uh, and I appreciate the history that, that you shared with us, uh, Danielle. And I think about, I mean, we know people like I mean, I'm old enough to have an idea what it was like in 1965, and there were people that did not have coverage, and there are still people that don't. Uh, but the fact that Multnomah County uh, can play such a significant and important role, and I think about the tours that I've been on, like uh, the WIC appointments that I had the opportunity to be in a doctor's appointment with a mom and a toddler and have have that you know that family served by Multnomah County or the um, the baby uh, dental visit and and just to see our providers and I know they don't do it for the money they do it because they're making such a difference to such an important uh, population of our community so I, I'm just always when I think about Multnomah County being the safety net provider it, it's our health departments, our health services. Like, that's what I think about. So uh, thank you all for being the backbone and um, happy National Healthcare Weekend. I think we get to see you this afternoon. It is wonderful to see the three of you here and know that there are many, many people behind you, beside you, working close, uh, closely with you. I'm very much, as Commissioner Samuel said, looking forward to attending the National Health Center Week celebration at the Rockwood Clinic today. And I just want to echo my fellow commissioners in thanking all of the ICS staff who have been at the forefront, not quite since 1965, although who knows, we may have some staff who have been around a long time and especially doing, during the critical work of the, um, of the pandemic. Um, appreciate Harold talking about the array of services provided. Um, this is a good time to get our message out. We can use this as a little PSA uh, to tell people out there if they um, are, you know, we are open for business. If people want to sign up at any of our clinics, we are happy to have new members always, and they will receive fabulous, fabulous care. Um, so I'm just really grateful for our health center staff, and I'm proud of how our um, community health clinics serve our community. I think we I usually have people read the proclamation first, which I did not today because I forgot, but I'm happy to have um, the, you please read the proclamation. Okay. Uh, Harold and I are going to split up the proclamation. Um, so. It's kind of like a duet. It is. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to hear me sing either, though. So. <laughs> Um, proclaiming August 7th through 13th, 2022 as National Health Center Week in Multnomah County, Oregon. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners finds, for over 50 years, community health centers have provided high quality, affordable, comprehensive, primary and preventative health care in our nation's underserved communities, delivering value to and having a significant impact on America's health care system. Community health centers are hubs for innovation and integrate medical, dental, and behavioral health care services into a single health home and consistently yield strong patient outcomes. Community health centers are a critical element of the health system, serving both rural and urban communities and often providing the only accessible and dependable source of primary care. Community health centers also play a critical role in reducing racial and ethnic, geographic, socioeconomic, and other health disparities in the United States. They are invaluable to ensuring that our nation's underserved populations, especially individuals and families living in poverty, rural communities, and in communities of color, are able to receive the care they need and deserve. Community health centers serve as beacons of essential resources and support in testing and treatment in the face of the global coronavirus pandemic and will continue to offer reliable, affordable, high quality care against COVID-19 for America's most vulnerable and underserved communities. Our nation's recovery uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic is stronger because of our health centers and the tireless, dedicated health center employees who continue to deliver critical health, um, health services, uh, such as COVID-19 testing, treatment and prevention services on the front lines. 
Health centers through the Health Center COVID-19 vaccine program have vaccinated and built vaccine confidence in millions of Americans from hard hit and high risk communities. So two thirds of individuals vaccinated at health centers so far identify as racial and ethnic minorities. Health centers have also offered greater flexibility during the pandemic by expanding telehealth services to those in need. Community health centers are governed by patient majority boards, ensuring that the patients of each health center are engaged in their, in their own health uh, care decisions. Community health centers are on the front lines of the engaging healthcare crisis, providing access to care to, for our nation's veterans, addressing the opioid epidemic, and responding to public health threats in the wake of natural disasters. The community health center model continues to prove an effective means of overcoming barriers to healthcare access, including geographic in, uh, income and insurance status, uh, improving healthcare outcomes and reducing healthcare system costs. So I'd like to say the Multnomah County uh, Board of County Commissioners proclaim August uh, 7 to 13th, 2022, proclaimed by National Health Center Week in Multnomah County, Oregon, and encouraging all Multnomah County residents to take part in this week by visiting the local health center and celebrating the important partnership between America's community health centers and communities they serve. And with that, I'd like to say you're also very much welcomed. Hope that uh, definitely we'll, we'll be able to get to see you all in the afternoon. Thank you. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jaipal. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. Chair Kofori. Aye. The proclamation is adopted. Thank you all. All right, uh, now we have come to the time on our agenda for uh, discussions on any non-agenda items. Uh, Commissioner um, Jayapal, did you have any comments? I do, I have uh, just one event to highlight. It's the 2022 Portland Youth Job Fair being held in person for the first time since 2019, like so many things. Um, the job fair focuses on opportunities for youth aged 16 to 24, but it's free and open to people of all ages and to the public. Attendees are encouraged to register in advance. Complete information, oh, it's 10 a.m. August 18th, and complete information can be found at youth.pdxjobfair.org. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to let you know, um, and my fellow commissioners, I'll be gone for a couple of weeks. I, I have the opportunity uh, to be a guest of the Overseas Korean Foundation uh, for something called uh, a Global Koreans Politicians Forum, where we are going to be gathering uh, folks from throughout the world in Seoul, South Korea, uh, to promote world peace and prosperity uh, and our continued friendship. So uh, I'm really excited and honored. Also, uh, Cheryl Mon uh, who works for, she's the Deputy Secretary of State, will be attending, and is also a Holt adoptee, and Dr. Edward Kimmy, who just got elected to the Beaverton City Council, uh, also Korean, so the three of us are representing in Oregon, so I'm really excited to go. So we'll report back to you when I return. And send photos, please. That sounds fabulous. Congratulations. Commissioner Myron? Thank you. Um, I do have a couple of things. And first of all, I just wanted to add actually to one thing about the, C, the community health centers that um, I wanted to highlight uh, efforts to show our appreciation. And um, I uh, wanted to call out my team working with Commissioner uh, Vega Peterson's office, in particular Tabitha, who really spearheaded so much of this work to enact an ongoing gratitude and appreciation campaign for uh, our integrated clinical services teams. Um, I've often said we need an office of gratitude here at the county, and I have to say if Tabitha was not preparing to apply for law school, she would be heading that up. So thank you um, there. And then I wanted to follow up on what I brought up last week about a letter um, regarding our public defense system 
and appreciate uh, Commissioner Jayapal, you're bringing up the crisis that we're facing around uh, public defense just in connection with our charter reform process and, and talking about some of that. We do have the highest rate of unrepresented individuals in the state due to lack of public defenders being able to provide those constitutionally required legal representation services. And so we have been working um, with Carl McPherson and the Metropolitan uh, Public Defender Services uh, to craft a letter to the Oregon Public Defense Commission. Um, and thanks to Christina from my office. I, I don't know if she's here. Oh, there you are, like right in front. Um, for all of her work on that letter, it's been finalized, circulated to your offices, along with some background information and um, and uh, hope you will be able to sign on or let me know if any questions. Um, there are this Saturday, Multnomah County Public Health Department in partnership with African CBO Coalition uh, and community members are going to be holding an inaugural conference. Um, really excited about this uh, starting at 3 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, you can go to my website for information. Uh, and I'm honored to be speaking there. And um, one final thing, uh, this is about meth and Old Town, and I want to give a shout out to my staff, to Cynthia and Tabitha, who volunteered this morning at Blanche House in Old Town to serve breakfast to unhoused community members. They looked a little bleary when they got to the office this morning, um, because they've been working since the crack of dawn. And we feel very strongly in our office that service to the community should not stay on one side of a computer screen. So it's a priority for us to really immerse in our community, witness those strengths and challenges firsthand. We're very grateful to Scott Kerman and Blanche House volunteers and staff like peer specialist Andy Abeta who provided, just spoke with um, Tabitha and Cynthia for a long time about what is going on on that front line. And they heard and saw this morning, and as we already know, so many people are struggling in crisis on our streets, particularly with substance use disorder, particularly with addiction to methamphetamine and fentanyl. Methamphetamine, fentanyl addiction this, this is an emergency, and yet we hear comments from the Oregon Health Authority saying things, this from the behavioral health director saying that because there's so much happening in the state, meth has had to take a back seat. Um, meth is a driver of so much. Meth needs to be in the front seat of what we are addressing. This impacts our foster care system, criminal justice system, homelessness, domestic violence, just so much in so many ways. And so um, we need to be doing so much more in our community about this. And I just want to appreciate the work being done by those organizations and people on the front line facing this every day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, he snuck off, I know, without having a big uh, to-do here at Multnomah County, but I do want to let people know that Liam Frost has gone to work for Metro. He is going to be working with uh, Patricia Rojas um, around the supportive services measure and the entire housing policy at, at Metro. So it's a great, great position for him, wonderful for Metro and wonderful for us. In his absence, um, his I wanted to let folks know in case they have questions. I know he handled some very important issues from my office. So if you um, have questions about the joint office, about housing or homelessness, uh, Becca Werbelau will be the contact person now. Um, if you have questions or want to talk about elections, Liz Smith-Curry is, is your gal. Um, any questions ar around Liam's portfolio related to rent assistance or DCHS or revenue goes to uh, Kim Melton, because she doesn't have enough on her plate already. So that is, um, we are again very, very excited for him. Sad, a little sad for us, but excited for him and for Metro on that great hire. And with that, we have no other business today, and we are adjourned. <laughs>